Hello, everybody. I'm Christy Co, the Executive Director of the Digital Economy Lab. Thank you so much for coming to our final seminar of the winter or the fall quarter. Um, we'll be picking music up, up again in February. Um, Eric Brynjolfsson wishes that he could be here. He is online, um, but he had to travel unexpectedly this week, and so I'm happy to host our speaker this week. Yan Lung is an assistant professor at the McCombs School of Business at the University of Texas at Austin. She's a core member of the UT Machine Learning Lab and an affiliate of the UT AI and Misinformation Initiative. She's also an affiliate with the MIT Media Lab. Her research is focused on computational social social science and network science using large-scale data sets, network theory, and machine learning to understand behaviors over networks. So we welcome and encourage questions during the seminar. If you're in the Zoom audience, please submit your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. We'll be watching that Zoom link. Um, and if you are in the room, you can raise your hand and we will ask questions um, directly in the room. Um, I am gonna ask us to sort of hold any sort of longer form questions till the end when we have our Q&A. Um, but if you have like a quick clarifying question that you would like for us to ask our speaker, um, we can ask those in the media areas as well. Um, and so I think with that, we can welcome Jan and let her start her presentation. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, Christy, for the introduction, and thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, it's a great honor to speak at the Stanford Digital Economy Lab. Uh, I'm a network scientist, so a lot of question that I'm interested in is about how individuals interact in um, a network environment and how these interactions would inform the design of machine learning methods. Um, when I was doing this type of research, I realized that um, this research really rely on high-quality network data. But this type of data may not always be available. And this motivates this line of research, which is to learn network structures from behavioral data. So we'll talk about the first keyword networks here. We are living in this increasingly connected society. You must have heard about the six degree of separation, which originate from an experiment done by Stanley Milgren back in 1960s, where he asked um, individuals in Nebraska to send a letter to strangers to a small town outside of Boston. And he found that on average, it takes six personal acquaintances to finish the task. Um, digital technologies has great and greatly shrinked um, the distance between individuals. A group of researchers at Facebook um, did an analysis on their platform and see that the degree of separation on their platform is about three and a half. Individuals are not only connected, their behavior also exhibits some similarities. Um, uh, Chris Takis and James Foland did a series of influential studies in early 2000, and they found that behaviors such as uh, smoking, habits leads to diabetes, and happiness exhibit a similarity up to th three degrees of separation. There not only exist similarities in individuals' behaviors, they also influence the decision-making of one another. And this type of social influence has been established in a wide range of behaviors. I'll just um, show two examples. Um, Bond, Bond did a very large-scale experiment involving about 60 million users on Facebook and found that um, political mobilization messages can influence voter turnout up to two degrees of separation. Another study done by myself um, and collaborators showed that social influence can spread through phone communications to up to four degrees of separation in attending some offline events. Now, um, this accumulative body of evidence on social connectivity and social influence motivate a lot of applications of um, networks in practice. The most prominent of it is this network intervention, which is the big body of work that um, covers different areas such as economics, healthcare, um, political science, and marketing. Network interventions uh, describes the process of using social network data to accelerate behavioral change, improve organizational performance, and expedite the diffusion of innovations. One of the most common type of network intervention is to use network data and identify the key influencers and opinion leaders in order to maximize the diffusion of information or maximize certain behavioral change. 
And we've seen such applications in um, fields such as political mobilization and increasing voter turnout and um, diffusing of healthy behaviors or immunization programs through um, for public health campaigns and the diffusion of innovations through new of new technologies and also the diffusion of new products for marketing and advertisement campaigns. The second common type of network intervention is network manipulation um, or network fragmentation, which talks about isolating or removal of individual nodes from the remaining of the networks. And the main purpose is to prevent the diffusion of information or um, certain type of disease so that one can either disrupt the disease transmission or to avoid mis um, misinformation propagation. So these type of network intervention will require us to have a good quality network data that are relevant to the behavior that um, the decision maker is interested in. The second type of network-based application would be related to profiling individuals based on their social networks or the behaviors of their social neighbors. This is mainly because a lot of the data that we collect on individual behavior are usually very sparse. We have very limited information about users. Therefore, if we know their social networks and also the behavior of their neighbors, we'll be able to improve our learning on their, uh, uh, their preferences as well as their financial status. Despite um, this wide applicability and usage of network data, this type of data may not always be available and make this type of network intervention and network profiling impossible. Um, here I list some typical sources uh, that we can collect network information. The first one being phone calls and messaging apps, which can be confidential and difficult to obtain. Second could be social media, which would cover a messy amount of network connections, and it's also hard to link the network data on social media to a certain type of behavior that we want to intervene. The last one is field studies, which could be the most accurate source of network information, but it can be highly costly and labor intensive. So mainly when policymakers and central planners um, wants to design some network interventions, they may not have access to the right network data. First, as I mentioned, it could be costly to collect in field studies because the experimenter needs to ask field workers to go out and ask individuals to name their friends. Second, many uh, marketplaces and service providers may not have uh, and engineer the social features onto their platforms. Therefore, they do not know how their customers are connected to one another. The third part, could, uh, the third one could be platforms uh, may also be interested in getting their competitors network data so that they can design some consumer poaching strategies. Even if when network data is available, the observed network may not be relevant to the behavior of interest. The first reason is that relationship is usually behavior dependent. So if you think about it, we all have different social roles. Depending on our social roles, we form different types of relationship and different relationships affect different types of behavior. For example, our social friends would affect of our off work activities and our professional friends will affect our job choices. Therefore, depending on the behavior that the central planner wants to intervene, different relationship will be of interest to them. Second, um, network is a dynamic term. Uh, new edges are created and old edges broke, which means that the accuracy of static network data would decay over time. This motivates um, this line of work um, that is to provide a framework so that we can dynamically monitoring and inferring the underlying network structures from observed actions. Now, I want to talk about the intuition of why this is possible before we get into the exact problem setup. As a motivated, individuals influence the decision making of one another. Now, uh, let me talk about two uh, broadly encompassing and general relationships. Uh, first one is complement, the other one is substitutive. So let's think about complementary relationship. 
when we decide how much time um, to spend on a social app, let's say Zoom or Slack, the more time our collaborators or um, colleagues uh, spend on these apps, the more utility we will gain by engaging on this app. And therefore, mm -hmm. our action, uh, our time spent on this app will also be higher. The other form is this substitutive uh, relationships. Now we can think about um, an example as whether to subscribe to an overleaf premium. The benefit for subscri subscription to this um, platform is that we'll be able to access version control or track history functions. As long as one individual in a team um, subscribes to this premium service, all individuals will be able to access these functionalities. Therefore, as long as one individual, um, if our friend, um, subscribe to this premium service, we do not need to make the purchase by ourselves because we can get the benefit without making the purchase. And as an outcome, we would observe negative relationship between individuals. And this is a substitutive relationship. This example um, showed that the observed actions could encode some network information because this type of strategic interactions between individuals. Now, um, today I'm going to talk about two papers that's closely related to each other, but with a slightly different setup. Uh, the first paper will talk about a joint learning approach in order to infer the network structure when a Zoomy individual behave according to a linear quadratic network game. And this is a widely studied game in the economic literature in um, modeling a wide range of behaviors. And um, in the second paper, we relax the assumption on the specific network game and generalize to broader set of network games. But this flexibility come at a cost of we need to collect a little bit more data on individual uh, networks so that we can train our method on a small set of um, observations with not only actions, but also network structure so that we can um, implement this mapping on a complete on an individual with uh, no networks available. And then I'll, I'll conclude with um, some applications. So um, just now I give some example about complementary and uh, substitutive relationship and such strategic interactions can be modeled as games on networks. And there are four basic elements um, in, in this uh, network games. We would have a set of players that are making decisions according to a payoff function. And their payoff functions is encode their interaction network, meaning that the friends, uh, the actions of their social neighbors would affect their utility and therefore affect their decisions. So now let's um, bring back the two examples that I have. Um, recall that I ha we have this strategic interactions for complementary and substitutive. So the way to think about this is that a given player's um, payoff to taking an action or taking a higher level action, if it is increasing in neighbors who take that action, this would be a complementary relationship. Um, if on the other hand, um, his relative payoff for taking that action is decreasing in neighbors who take that action, that will be a substitutive uh, relationship. Now, we want to more model this more formally using this linear quadratic uh, payoff function, which is widely used to model behaviors such as peer effects and uh, consumption externalities. So let's take a look at um, this utility function. So for individual U, we have utility function UI, and we have three main components um, that we can think about it as uh, individual effect and also network effect. An individual effect, um, we have two parts. The first part is related to the benefit individual gain by performing that action. And the second part is, is a quadratic cost um, to the focal individual who performed that action. And in these first component, we have a marginal benefit um, represented as BI. And we also have this individual action um, represented as AI. Now in the network uh, part, we have a very important component, which is this beta that captures the network factor. When beta is positive, we'll see that if the action of neighbor AJ is higher, individual's utility will be higher if individual perform higher levels of action. So this is a complementary relationship, higher level of neighbor motivate individual I to perform higher action as well. Now when beta is, positive, uh, is negative, 
you see that if the action of neighbor is higher, then individual would reduce their actions, so reduce AI, so that the utility of this focal individual I will, will increase. So let's think about uh, a bit more example. Um, I have two examples here um, to characterize these two types of uh, network games. Now let's think about in a coursework setting where actions are time spent on the coursework and the payoff um, can be the test score. Now you, uh, students wants to get higher score and they, they can uh, spend higher time to uh, uh, get that te higher test score. Now, if some individuals or some students in the classroom works really hard, that would create a stimulating environment, motivating everyone to work hard in order to get higher test score. So this is the complement relationship. Now we can think of another example, which is in teamwork, um, and the action is time spent on a joint project, and the payoff is their performance for this joint project. If some individuals works really hard, that might actually motivate others to shirk responsibilities in this setting. So this would be a um, substitutive uh, relationship. You see negative uh, correlations between neighbors' actions. Now with that um, utility function, uh, we can um, take the first order derivative and get the pure strategy Nash equilibrium. So here we use this as the best predictor for individuals' actions. Now this um, will see that individuals um, Nash, pure strategy Nash equilibrium will be a function of their network structure as well as the marginal uh, benefit. And this solution is well defined only if the spectral radius of um, this beta G is smaller than one. This is just a technical assumption that we make uh, to make sure that the Nash equilibrium exists. Now, if we expand out um, this term with the geometric series, we'll see that this payoff dependence will spread indirectly to the network. Now, you see that this is relevant to the examples that, that I provided in the beginning. Uh, the social influence could have longer range uh, dependencies. Um, if you recall the example that I gave on uh, voter turnout and also in adopting uh, offline behaviors. So um, then um, we, 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 you, we can use a optimization framework to help us to solve this network structure because what um, we have seen up to now is that this observations on, on uh, actions can encode some information about um, the network structure. So if we, ex uh, we can write out the Nash equil equilibrium in the following way, and then in our learning setup, we consider a number of game over the same network. Then for different games, we have different marginal benefit and different marginal benefit will induce different actions. Now here, the marginal benefit is unobserved and the action is observed. So basically only action is observed and we want to use this to infer both the network structure as well as the marginal benefit. So here is the joint, joint optimization problem that we propose that um, in our objective function, we want to minimize the difference between the observed and um, the predicted action. So this is in our fidelity term. And then we have um, some constraint on the network structure. So basically it should be symmetric, entries uh, should, not, should be non-negative, and then the diagonal should be zero. We also uh, constrain the volume of the graph to be the number of nodes. Um, this is a, just a technical uh, constraint to make sure that we don't have trivial solution. In terms of the regularization, we add two regularization. The reason being that if you think about this problem, it's very difficult considering the number of parameters that we want to predict because the, the network can be, um, uh, we, 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 the, the scale of the parameter is n to the power where n is the number of users. And um, the first one is we add an L2 norm on the graph structure. So if we combine the L1 and L2, this is similar to uh, the elastic net regression. If you're familiar with um, um, uh, machine learning, basically it's a combination of, of ridge and lasso regression. And then we assume um, that individuals' marginal benefit are independent on the networks um, so, so that we can add this term to reflect our um, assum assumption that marginal benefit being independent. And then for this optimization problem, it is a quadratic program jointly convex in G and B, so we can um, solve uh, this, th this problem easily. Um, 
we also propose another uh, framework that is complementary to the first one by making another assumption on the marginal benefits. Now, one common assumption in on social networks is hom uh, homophily, which is a widely existence phenomenon on social networks, which says that individuals who share similar characteristics are more likely to connect with one another. Now, in this setting, um, it means that individuals who have similar marginal benefit, think about it as um, their benefit by engaging on um, Slack or Zoom, will be similar. So to reflect this, we add these assumptions into our framework. So uh, this I have an illustration uh, for individuals who have similar marginal benefit for playing guitar, they are more likely to connect it than um, with someone who have low, uh, pref uh, low marginal benefit for, to uh, perform this instrument. So given homophily, the marginal benefit will be smooth on the graph. And by smooth, we mean that neighboring vertices on the network will have similar marginal benefit. So we can uh, think about it as um, here I have a representation for graphs. So I have, have node from v, V1 to V9. And then I use vertical bar to represent their marginal benefit for playing guitar with red represent positive and blue represent negative. And the height of the bar represent the strength of the marginal benefit. So if um, with a smooth and homophily assumption in place, we would expect a graph to be something like this. That is, V1 to 3 are more likely to connect because they have high marginal benefit for playing guitar. And 7, 8, 9 are more likely to connect because they have very low and negative um, that marginal benefit for playing guitar. So in order to incorporate this into the objective function, we can use this term, minimize, uh, we can minimize this term. The way to think about this is uh, GIJ is the network. If I, uh, 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 G, uh, G is the network and GIJ equals one, meaning that I and J are connected. So here, if B, I and, B, J, I and J are connected, we would want to B, I and B, J to be as close as possible, meaning that we would want this marginal benefit between two individuals to be as close to each other as possible. And then we can write down this term using this um, graph uh, Laplacian term, where uh, this graph Laplacian, uh, the Laplacian matrix L is um, the difference between the degree matrix and the adjacency matrix. Now, with this model on um, the homophilus marginal benefit, we can add it into this objective function. Now, it's similar to what we see just now. And the only difference is we subtract the L2 norm on the marginal benefit B with this graph Laplacian term. Now, this problem eh, gets difficult to solve um, because it's no longer jointly convex in the adjacency matrix and the marginal benefit. So the way we solve it is that we use um, block coordinate descent, meaning that we fix the graph structure, solve for marginal benefit, and then we fix the marginal benefit, solve for the graph, graph structure. We um, iterate this uh, until, until the problem converges. So both subplot problems are convex, um, therefore we can converge to a local minimum. So that is um, about our uh, joint learning problem to get the graph structure and the marginal benefit. And um, I'll, I'm going to show you some uh, simulation data and then we can see some real world data. So we simulate um, three types of graph, uh, Ardo Shrani, which is a purely random graph, uh, Wurzschroh gets, which is a regular graph and we add a little bit rewiring. So meaning we add a little bit randomness to the graph. And then we have Baobasi Albert, which will have um, a hub structure um, that will be very, more similar to real world networks. Um, in terms of the data generation process, we will compute beta, which this is the strength of um, influence um, so that it is in line with our technical assumption. And then we will initialize the marginal benefit for a number of games. Here, uh, just for the sake of time, uh, I'll only show you um, the frame, uh, the results where we assume uh, the marginal benefit is homophilous. And then, Based on this uh, marginal benefit, we can generate uh, the equilibrium actions. In terms of our evaluations, we will use this area under the curve, which is used in binary classification whenever the positive and the negative observations are not balanced. 
And uh, the benefit of using this metric is that the natural benchmark would be a random uh, method that will give us a AOC of 0.5. In terms of the baseline method, we use sample correlation and also regularized graphical lists. Um, so we want to see three, uh, I'll show you three pro um, main results to see how the performance change with the different parameters. So how the difficulty of the task uh, increase or decrease with respect to different parameters in this problem. So the first one that we see will be the strength of um, the strategic interaction. So in the extreme case, um, if the strategic interaction is zero, meaning that individuals do not strategically interact with one another, then the, the actions will encode very minimal information about the graph. And therefore, in that setting, it will be very difficult to infer the graph structure from the actions. So here I show um, the uh, three examples um, from uh, Erdo Shreni, Wistro Gatz, and Barabasi Albert. X axis is the spectral radius. So this beta term will increase along the Y axis and then um, along the X axis and the Y axis is AUC. The higher, the better. And 0.5 is a, is a, is a random benchmark. Our method is the um, red one. So you see that on the uh, bulk part, we perform better than the two benchmarks. And also you see that the performance increase as the strategic interactions increase so that the actions encode more information about the graph structure. Mm -hmm. The second one is um, network density. Um, so here uh, we <clears throat> still, it's from Erdo Shreni, Wistro Getz, and Barabasi Albert. And along the X axis, we vary different parameters that control the density of the graph. As we go rightward, the density increases. So what we see is that the performance will decrease as the density of the graph gets, uh, the density of the graph grows. The reason is that um, in a sparser graph, it's easier to tell where the payoff dependencies and where the influence comes from. While, while when the network get denser, it's very hard to dis disentangle who influence decision of whom. So the, 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 the learning problem get harder. And then <clears throat> the last one, we show the strength of homophily in the marginal benefit. And here, um, still on the x-axis, access, we show the three graphs, Erdo Shreni, Wistro Getz, and Barabasi Albert, and y-axis, we show um, the AUC. So um, here, what we see is that as we increase the strength of homophily on the marginal benefit, the performance increase. The reason being that um, when there are more information in the, uh, more homophily in the marginal benefit, that means that there is more information about the graph in marginal benefit that will translate into more information in um, about graph on the action as well. So action will encode more information about the graph structure as the strength of homophily increase in marginal benefit. So I'm going to show you two real world um, data set, uh, one collected in an offline setup, another collected in an online setup. In the offline setup, we have uh, Indian villages where the agents here will be the households and the actions will be the facilities adopted by the households. In terms of the relationship, this will be complement because individuals, a household's behavior will be similar to one another um, in this uh, offline social network. And in terms of the ground truth data, we compare our results with some self-reported data collected in the field studies. You see that um, the y-axis, we compare the improvement of our performance relative to a random benchmark, which would be 0.5. You see that we can improve upon random by about uh, 15%, and that's the best uh, among uh, these benchmarks, uh, these methods. The second one is in Foursquare, uh, which is um, a online marketplace where individuals can provide their ratings on different um, bus businesses and venues. The agents here will be Foursquare users and their actions will be the ratings on different venues. Here, we would expect the relationship to be complement as well because of social norm and social influence, individuals will be affected in a positive way by their neighbors. And in terms of the ground truth, um, here we use um, the online social network that are provided by Foursquare. 
uh, just know that here we the the ground truth is only used for evaluation purpose because we have um, to when we evaluate our method we need to compare it against some um, ground truth data but when people implement our method there is no need to collect any social network data so for this one we see that we can improve the um, uh, random benchmark by about 25 percent uh, this is because in this setting we have a much larger number of behaviors that we observe on users and therefore we can achieve um, better performance improvement so uh, that's about um, the first paper um, <clears throat> you see that I made some assumption on individual will behave according to linear quadratic game and some people would wonder whether this would hold for all behaviors so that motivate us to study the second um, paper which is to develop a deep learning approach uh, so that we can infer the networks by losing the assumption on the network games now, as I mentioned in the beginning, this would not come for free because if we want to gain some flexibility in terms of the assumptions that we make, then um, we need to acquire a bit more data to make the learning possible. So uh, here we change the setup a little bit. Basically, we want to learn the mapping from decisions to network structures now that we don't make explicit uh, assumption on the utility function. And then the requirement is that we would observe the decisions and network structure on the training data set. So on a small population, who, um, the central planner needs to collect some data about social networks. And our framework will learn the mapping so that they can implement our method and um, uh, implement our method on a much larger uh, population without the need to collect all data. And the assumption that we need to make here is that the utility function of the training set and the test set need to be the same to make um, this transfer possible. Um, so we want to apply this mapping uh, to help infer a completely unobserved network. So for those of you that are familiar with uh, the computer science uh, literature might know that there is a, the large literature on a link prediction. So basically given some random observed link, we want to infer the remaining of the links. Now the difference between our, our problem setup with that literature is that for a task population, we do not observe any single links. So I want to uh, talk a bit about some other um, uh, network games in the literature, and then we can see how we can generalize this and how we can use this to motivate the design of our deep learning framework. The first, uh, uh, the second network game that we study here is called um, action conforming game. So the intuition is that individuals may prefer to conform to some social norm, which is an aggregation of action of their social neighbors. So basically, this is the utility function, and um, I changed the notation a little bit in this paper. So we have X as the action and um, A as the adjacency matrix. So you see that individuals will want to behave according to the average, uh, the, the aggregation of their neighbors as much as possible in order to increase their utility. So as long as they deviate from the aggregate action of their neighbors, their utility, because there is a um, negative term here, the utility will uh, reduce. Now we can get um, the equilibrium action in the following way. For those of you uh, that are familiar with eigen decomposition, you will see that basically the solution to this problem will be the eigenvector centrality or the eigenvector correspond to the largest eigenvalue. The third game that uh, we study here is this linear influence game, which is motivated by the threshold model in the diffusion literature, uh, mm -hmm. which basically says that if a certain number or certain proportion of neighbors among one's um, local neighborhood adopt certain behavior, the individuals uh, will adopt this behavior as well. So we, use, we relax this to a continuous setting so you see that uh, this is the adjacency matrix. We similarly have X as the decisions, and then we have a threshold term here. So if the aggregated action of neighbors exceed above certain threshold, and this threshold is heterogeneous across different individuals, then this individual will um, adopt certain action. 
So then we can get uh, the equilibrium action in the following way, which is the inverse of the adjacency matrix multiply some heterogeneous um, threshold. Now we want to summarize these different uh, network games. So recall that we have a linear quadratic game um, where the equilibrium action is um, the inverse of we subtracting beta A from the identity matrix, multiply some heterogeneous marginal benefit. And then we have this linear influence game, which is this inverse of adjacency matrix, multiply um, these um, heterogeneous threshold. And then we have this action conforming game, which doesn't have a heterogeneous term, um, is only affected by the network structure. So you'll see that all of them have some common commonalities. Um, part of it comes from this, uh, they have a part of the function comes from the adjacency matrix and part of the Nash equilibrium comes from um, some idiosyncratic individual uh, characteristics. So then we can see that um, in terms of the function of adjacency matrix, the linear quadratic uh, function takes the following form. And then the linear influence takes the inverse of the adjacency matrix and the action conforming games would take the eigenvector um, centrality. And then for this um, idiosyncratic individual term, uh, we have linear quadratic using the heterogeneous marginal benefit. Linear influence take the heterogeneous um, threshold and um, the action conforming game, which is the uh, homogeneous vector of one. So that motivates our design of um, this uh, deep learning approach. So let me talk a bit up first about our problem setup. We observe some action graph pair that comes from the game um, with some unknown utility functions. And then for each pair, um, we index by L, this model will take the action and also the graph uh, with the number of users. And for, for these users, we collect a number of games. And then we will output a, util, uh, a predicted adjacency matrix for that uh, network game. And then um, our loss function is to minimize the uh, cross entropy between the observed and the predicted networks on the training set. So recall that now in our setting, we have to observe some of the network structures on the training set to make this learning on the mapping possible. And I want to talk about two properties that our method needs to maintain um, in this uh, uh, problem uh, for, for our problem. The first one, we call it permutation equivariant over the set of node, which means that the node index doesn't encode any information. So we, can, we should be able to shuffle the ordering of the node and still the, the method should hold. Um, this is because the index, we can uh, assign index to different uh, individual nodes in a graph and the index themselves should not matter. The second uh, one is also very important, which is permutation invariant over the set of games meaning that there is no should be no correspondence between a game indexed by k in part of one part of one of the graph and a game k in another graph so if you think about it as um, we want to uh, predict these uh, uh, networks on the Yelp platforms and part of our training set are collected from Palo Alto and part of our test set is collected from San Francisco and k would index a uh, different game would index different restaurants so a restaurant in restaurant one in Palo Alto would not correspond to restaurant one in San Francisco because we need to uh, implement our method and uh, predict uh, implement our, our method on the unseen test set. So if we accidentally do this mapping, meaning that if we accidentally do correspond um, a restaurant in Palo Alto to San Francisco, then our method uh, will have some issues. So we need to uh, have this permutation invariant um, property. So in terms of our overall framework, um, it's a um, auto encoder framework, uh, which we call it network game transformer in short form nugget. So the input will be uh, the player's actions um, that will be in matrix form, uh, rows being individual users and columns being the index of the network games. And the output will be the adjacency matrix that will be a uh, number of user by number of user. And then the intermediate output is this um, game specific encoding, meaning that for each individual for each game we will learn a latent representation that can mimic this uh, term for uh, B if you recall that term in, in, in our framework. 
So this, the first uh, part, we call it uh, an encoder. So we encode the player action into some game specific encoding. And then for the decoder, we will take this game specific encoding and output the adjacency matrix. So uh, next two slide will be uh, uh, a bit dry with some equations, but I'll, I'll try to quickly go through it. Um, the, the first, uh, recall that we have this transformer-like encoder. Basically, we want to expand individual actions into a vector of uh, F features. So X will be the individual I's actions on the K game. And then we multiply it with a learnable parameter um, uh, and, and add, it, add some uh, learnable scalar. And with, with this, we transform it from a nonlinear transformation function and get um, this game-specific representation. And the second step is uh, this neighbor attention. The goal is to get the predictive power of each neighbor of J towards um, individual I for each game. So basically for each individuals in the network, we want to learn a neighbor intention, attention that tell us how much attention a individual should pay to each of the neighbors. So here we take in the game specific representation from the previous step of two individuals, multiply it with um, some uh, learnable weights. So here we have this WQ and WK are this learnable weights from deep learning uh, framework. And then we would aggregate over a number of K games, pass it through a softmax function. The goal of this is that the attention individual I pays to each individual J would sum up to to one. So we, we do a normalization with this softmax function. And um, lastly, after we get this game specific uh, neighbor attention, we will pass it and combine it with the game specific representation as a refinement. So for each individuals, the final game specific embedding will be um, um, Part of it comes from its own representation and part of it comes from all of the individuals in the networks. So, so from that, we'll get this transformer-like embedding. And then uh, that's the second part of our um, framework is called a decoder. Uh, the input to the decoder will be this um, uh, game, game specific embedding from the previous layer. And then we would do element wise product to make sure that uh, it, it has this permutation equivariant property. So that um, is permutation equivariant with respect to the node so that the node ordering uh, shouldn't matter. And then when we combine different game specific embedding, we will need to make sure that it uses permutation invariant operator so that there's no correspondence between a game indexed by K in one, part, one graph to another graph, um, to another game indexed by K in another graph. So with this transformation, we can get um, these uh, uh, weights in this predicted adjacency matrix, and we try to minimize the difference between the predicted and the observed um, adjacency matrix in the training set um, using cross entropy loss. Um, in terms of the experiments, I'll show you some results on um, real world data set. Uh, this are uh, still two data sets, one in offline uh, setup, the other in online setup. So the first one is uh, the Indian villages. Um, it's similar to the previous than one that I showed you, um, we have a group of households and the actions will be the, um, the facilities adopted by different households and the relationship will complement uh, will be complement because of social influence and social norm. So here we have about 75 um, villages and we compare it with the ground truth self-reported uh, graph. Uh, note that um, this experiment, in this experiment setup, we need to make sure that we, uh, in our training set, we observe some of the network um, structures to make the uh, learning possible. So we cut this data set into 80, 10, 10. We have 80% of the data that are used in the training set, 10% we use it as validation, and we evaluate it on, only on the 10% data set. 
So here um, in uh, this, uh, this result, we show the AUC, which is the area under uh, the curve, similar as before. Um, we added a bit more um, uh, benchmarks, um, and these benchmarks would require us to know the ground truth um, graph. That's why I didn't. Uh, we didn't compare to this before. So you see that among all method, um, as, uh, including our previous approach, which is. I have a quick question yeah. from Eric, which is: Can you say a little bit more about how the self-reported graph? Data yeah, yeah. Is okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Sure. Is that coming? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. yeah that's very good. Yeah. So uh, this data set was actually uh, pub publicized um, by this poverty lab, uh, Jay Paul at MIT. Mm -hmm. So they have a group of researchers, um, the field workers. They will go go out to the household and ask them to name who are their friends. So we use that this type of self-reported network as the mm -hmm. ground truth. So uh, that actually, uh, so I'll just quickly highlight. Uh, so one of the benefit of our approach is that uh, with our approach, they don't need to have this um, labor intensive process to ask everyone to name who their neighbor is. So they can use our approach to, um, uh, they can collect data from a small number of villages and then implement it on a larger set of uh, villages. So to reduce the cost to collect such data, because this can be a very uh, labor intensive uh, process. And also, um, with this type of uh, data, with their type of data collection, um, because the network is dynamic, this accuracy of the data collected via this um, field field studies would decay over time. Rapidly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, and. Um, and um, so the second uh, type, uh, second uh, study, so that's about offline uh, data set. Um, the, the second uh, data set that we use is from the Yelp um, platform, which is the crowdsourcing review platform. Um, so the agents on these platforms are uh, Yelp users. And their actions are, uh, we, we use the average rating on different business categories. So the relationship here, we think, is also a complement. So because of social influence and uh, social norm. So um, on this graph, um, we segment the Yelp uh, graph into different subgraphs. We can think about it as a community. And then the ground truth network we compare with um, it, to evaluate our method is the, the online social networks. So in this setup, part of the data set, um, we use it for training a purpose. And then about 80% 80 we, 80 we use for training, 10% we use for validation. And then we will evaluate on the only 10% data set. So you see that um, our method is uh, outperform all method in terms of um, uh, predicting the adjacency matrix. I want to highlight a little bit on uh, our, our previous method here, uh, which is uh, about 0.3% lower than our new data set. But, but uh, the interesting thing is that our previous method does not require any network data available, while here we still need to collect uh, some data. So this would mean that on the Yelp platform, um, individuals could behave very similar to a linear quadratic game. That's why without, even, without training data, we could get similar performance to uh, our new method when there are uh, some, some some ground truth adjacency matrix are uh, required. Okay, um, so that's about um, the two papers um, that I talk about. And I want to show you two applications tied back to uh, my beginning slide, uh, my motivation slide on um, the importance of uh, na knowing network information for network based uh, interventions. And then um, I'll conclude and take questions. The first interaction, uh, the first network intervention that we consider here is a marketing campaign. And here, um, the method that I use to demonstrate this intervention is with our first approach, where we do not observe uh, any network data at all. And uh, consider a setting where um, a central planner wants to send a product sample to one individual in each village. You can think about it as um, um, diffusing some, some technology that can benefit their uh, ag ag agriculture. 
And then one, one strategy would be that they could do a random pick an individual. Um, and another strategy that they could do is that they can use our method to infer the um, eigenvector centrality. And then they could uh, uh, design uh, set, do the seeding strategy um, according to the largest eigenvector centrality. Now we do the simulation in this setup uh, using uh, independent cascade model and assuming that um, the diffusion rate is 0.1, we see that in terms of the improvement in coverage um, with our method, this coverage could be improved by about uh, 12%. Another uh, ex uh, intervention that we uh, uh, compare here is this um, targeted incentive design. Um, this is actually from a paper done by Galliotti and Ben Golub. I think he gave a talk about this paper maybe this this year or last year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the so the, he the, in their paper they design a optimal network based inter, uh, network based intervention um, by changing individuals' uh, marginal benefit with the same uh, game uh, setup. So, uh, but in their method, they people need to uh, observe the network structure, and that's an additional information that we can provide as input to their framework. So in terms of the setup, um, a, a central planner may want to map, maximize the aggregate um, payoff of the players. And then the uh, strategy that they could deploy is to adjust the marginal benefit um, to be proportional to the eigenvector centrality. And to get this eigenvector centrality, we need to know the network structure. And we can think about a concrete example as um, individual may, uh, a central planner want to maximize the total payoff for adopt, adopting a new, let's say, agricultural technology. And then they can provide some supplementary technologies by changing, uh, we can think about mathematically by changing the um, marginal benefit of the individuals. So then um, this would also require the knowledge of the marginal benefit of individual as well. And that um, signals one another benefit of our approach is that we can infer this marginal benefit from individual's actions. So we can provide the marginal benefit as well as the graph structure that is necessary for this type of network, uh, a targeted uh, network uh, incentive design. So here, as an example, we show that um, if this individual has about, uh, if a central planner has about 10,000 budget to allocate um, to one village uh, that is about um, 100 to 200 individuals, um, they can get about a 1.7 time increase in the overall payoff by using our method to infer the network structure and the marginal benefit, comparing with doing so in a homogeneous or random way. So uh, then I will uh, conclude. Um, so uh, this I'm, I presented two paper under this agenda to learn network structures from the behavioral data. The main contribution is that we integrate uh, machine learning with the strategic interactions of individuals in order to learn this underlying strategic interactions and infer this type of strategic interaction from the observed um, action uh, or the observed behavioral data. In the first framework, we have a joint learning framework uh, to get to ob obtain this uh, linear quadratic game payoff. And the benefit of that um, setup is that we do not need any network data. And then in the second paper, we relax the assumption on the linear quadratic game and extend it to a broader set of network games. Um, the benefit is we do not need to have um, any assumption on the utility function, but this flexibility comes at the cost that we need some training data set um, for a small population. We need to obtain the network structure. We demonstrate the effectiveness of uh, the method in both uh, synthetic and real world settings. And this type of approach can provide uh, building blocks for network-based interventions and network-based profiling. Uh, lastly, uh, we also contribute um, to this emerging field of data-driven structural inf uh, inference uh, in computer science. So basically there is a recent interest in learning the underlying structures for different uh, domains. And what we are interested in is to learning these structures when individuals strategically interact with one another. Now, in terms of future works, um, the first line of future work is that we want to 
directly learn the optimal interactions from the actions because sometimes the optimal interaction or optimal incentive structures do not require us to have the full information about the adjacency matrix. So then um, what will be interesting is to think about whether it's possible to um, go back from our sec second setting to the unsupervised setting. So we don't have any network data available, but is this still possible to get the um, most important uh, moment from the graph structure? And the second future direction is that you see uh, currently another um, uh, assumption that we have in our work is that the network structure is uh, static and individuals um, do not uh, interact repeatedly and they are not forward looking. And all these considerations will be interesting to take into account uh, when developing method for these uh, agenda. So with that, I wanna thank you for your attention and um, I'll take questions and comments. about um uh I, I guess i guess in general high level question about where the limitations are in, in using this kind of network data because it it seems like you know for the applications that, that you've done i don't have so much of an issue because it's sort of predicting predicting kind of a magnitude and outcome but what, what i have in mind is that like you're using the behaviors to then estimate the network structure and then a lot of people are going to be tempted to then use the network structure to predict behaviors. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But obviously, that's not going to be. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, so, so, yeah. A lot of a lot of my interests are also related to use the network to predict the behaviors. Now, the the um, limitation of that approach, or um, is that sometimes this type of network data is not available. So, um, it, you feel so one example in the um. Uh, J Paul setting, so where this researchers needs to go out to the field and collect this network data, then collecting this data can be a very costly process. And also the accuracy of this data could decay over time. So if we have a automatic method to help us monitor the network change, um, that is what we try to contribute. And the second um, is that um, a lot of time network is a very fuzzily defined term, right? So depending uh, on different behaviors, different network would be more uh, prevalent. So if we think about um, diffusing uh, or, or doing some marketing campaign for let's say office setup, then I want to identify your uh, professional connections. If I want to recommend um, off work activities, escape rooms, et cetera, I want to know who your social friends is. So, so a lot, despite sometimes we have network data, network data may not be tied to the specific behavior of interest uh, to the central decision maker. That's also one contribution of our approach is that we can identify this relationship that is relevant to the be behavior. Yeah, the, the other one just briefly that I had in mind that kind of created similar problems in, in my head anyway, where if there's like strategic networking, uh, and so the, the network structure itself is kind of endogenously determined, or or if there are kind of gaps in in the data where you're not able to observe all the network ties. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be good application of our approach. So I think of research that there's there are uh, these processes that you can't observe, mm -hmm. like we're friends or we work together, or whatever. And it depends on the particular activities what network you're going to get, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so actually seeing the changes in the connections. Tells you that oh this is something that's different somehow because uh, these these are all team leaders right mm -hmm. but the part I was interested in actually is the causality because um, I mean we know that the model you have for intervention is about uh, essentially diffusion right? yeah yeah cause you to change that causes her to change but, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but in different domains there's distinct causality yeah yeah yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, so that seems to be something that I'm seeing more and more emphasis on for interventions. Uh, and then the other thing, which I know you've done some on, is uh, block stochastic models. Mm, mm, mm. So so blocks, um, which is everybody yeah. knows those are. So, those are so, so networks are not uniform statistics that come in clumps. But if you can detect the clumps, that tells you something about the underlying processes that you can then incorporate in other Sorts of influence processes, right? Like, oh, these are all in this thing, the village. These are all the women in the village mm -hmm. that they tend to influence each other in a way that's different. Than, you know. But maybe you can talk about causality. Yeah, so, yeah, that's a good point. So, so, um, yeah, so. 
back to what you're asking and also what Sandy commented. So a lot of networks that we observed, so this type of influence or causality link do not necessarily, uh, may not necessarily exist. So basically based on the as assumption of our utility function, we want, it, it is the, we can think about it as a causal influence. So because one individual would affect the utility of another individual and therefore uh, because the utility changed, the behavior of certain individual also changed. So it tries to get to this causal uh, relationships. So if uh, under the assumption of our network games. <laughs> I don't know if I maybe I didn't understand you. I mean, even in randomized controlled trials, mm. you say, okay, well, there's two things. It's statistically different. I did treatment here. I did do it there. Is it different? Yeah. But that doesn't actually solve the true causality because it could be a third thing that you didn't observe is actually driving the whole thing. Right, 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 right. right, right. So it's just the fact that these things are correlated in time or behavior right. doesn't tell me that they're actually influencing each other. Right, 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 right. right. Just so that there is. A, in probability, there's a connection. Yeah, or there right. could be competition effects, or uh, it mm. seems like in general a lot more complex. Right. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. That that's true. So, one assumption that we make here is that uh, individuals we would be well. Oh, let me put it this way. So, uh, there are two two um, uh, papers that I present. So, the second paper definitely we could could not get to the causality part. It's more like it's a it's a basically a prediction problem, and the first one is that under the assumption of the network game structure that is a causal relationships or be, because what we are saying is that individuals affect the utility and also uh, hence the behavior of another individual so there is an inherent causal uh, assumption in our approach this is like, so like rcts where you say we have now control for all the things that could be causal and uh, so in my sample yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, okay okay, okay. Yeah, that's in that point. case that really was is causal, but I don't believe it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's okay, okay, okay. That, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I see that under your assumption. Yeah, 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 yeah. Game, sure. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But I don't believe it. that. That's sort of like your question earlier. There's, a, there's this unobserved structure uh, that can change depending on the topic that that uh, we don't know the causal structure of. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm saying that so, we're also at time. Okay, oh, we went over a little bit oh. over, but thank let's let's thank our speaker one more time. Um, thank you. And thank you all for joining us for our last seminar of the quarter. And we'll see you guys again when we start things back up again in the new year. All right, thanks, everybody. Thank